Have you ever noticed the face on the iPhone? Do you mean like the cameras? While we were getting ready today, I was looking at my iPhone. And then I noticed that the iPhone is looking right back at me. No, I never noticed those ones. (laughs) Oh, yeah, look at that. Well, I have to get a new phone now. (laughs) I just wanted to point out for anyone who has an iPhone that does not have the home button that has the new line across the bottom. On the lock screen, it makes a little face. The line is the mouth, the camera button, and the flashlight button are the two eyes that look at you. And now I cannot unsee this forever. Well, here's the thing that makes it kind of worse. If you just leave the iPhone on, the mouth starts to move, right? So it's going like, hmm, at me if I sit there for long enough. It goes a little, hmm. And what I think is extra funny is the effect on my phone when I swipe up from the lock screen. For but a brief moment, there is a face at the very top of the iPhone. So, (laughs) cannot unsee. That's really good. It's just like judging, like, what are you doing with this home screen? (laughs) Maybe I'll make this my new background. I'll just screenshot that face at the top of my phone and leave it like that. God, that would be brilliant and also be (laughs) so confusing. (laughs) iPhone, always judging. How you doing, Mike? I'm good. I, um... We're going to talk about the American meme today. American meme. We're going to talk about that later on in the show. Mm -hmm. But I watched it today, and uh, it is is actually a pretty depressing documentary. Well, I found it pretty depressing. Wow, spoilers, Mike. (laughs) Well, I I wished I would have been able to warn people uh, beforehand, but I didn't really (laughs) know much about it. Uh, But yeah, I found it fascinating, and we'll get into why, but... Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was the right pre-show uh, entertainment for me today, but... <laughs> Probably not. Probably, Probably not, not the, the thing to put you in a, a real cheery mood right mm. before starting a podcast. <laughs> just question everything I know and uh, be just judge my own existence and my own uh, career. This is it's all good. Feeling good. Good. I'm glad you're. I'm glad you're feeling great. <laughs> yep, feeling real good. I wanted to ask you actually. Uh, mm-hmm. I feel like there is a a thread that we never, um, we never got back to, which was something that you. I think you mentioned that you would update us on towards the end of the year, which was a uh, one of your mysterious projects. I don't have any mysterious projects. Mike. Project I mean... uh, Golem. <laughs> yes, Project Golem. Yes, that that was a thread we had not finished. Sewing? I couldn't think of the way to finish that metaphor either, so I just like, oh, we didn't come back to it. I'd be like, tying it? Do you tie a knot in it? Is that what you do? I think, maybe. I, mean, I, was, I was enjoying, I don't know if Mike's going to edit it down for the final version of the podcast, but I, I enjoyed the good 30 seconds of silence as you tried in your head to figure out the way to close now, this metaphor. Now, come on. Open. Now, come on. That's not, the, I'm going to leave it in its entirety now, so people will know oh. it wasn't 30 seconds of silence. And I just but, sit but, there just like a robot, like I was just like waiting. Just, will they know, will they trust it, that it's the actual amount of silence? That's very easy the to sen- fix in post. The sensorial hand of Mike comes down again, <laughs> even on his own silences. <laughs> but yes, I, th- I feel like this was, uh, we've been talking in the, the past couple episodes about uh, the yearly themes that we have going on. Mm-hmm. And th- this is the, the one the one note that I had made in my private Cortex show notes to myself a year ago was to update people in the future about Project Golem. And it just, we never quite got around to it in either of the discussions. Am I right in remembering that this was uh, like a project for you that was like, if you didn't do it, then you probably weren't going to do it. Am I remembering that rightly? So this is this is why I feel that like I'm going to mention it here because I did specifically say that I should have some kind of update for this right. one way or the other. Uh, whereas sometimes, not that I not that I have mysterious projects, but if I did have mysterious projects, they might also if just mysteriously you disappear. One to be known <laughs> as such right. a person, right? This, which is not. What I am, so I just want. It's not your character. It'd be out of character, really, for you, if uh, you did do that. You know, I don't appreciate. I don't appreciate that remark. It's it's (laughs) definitionally untrue every time. But so here's here's the thing. It was it was the way I pitched it as it was a big thing that I sort of wanted to do uh, for myself as a as a 
different and interesting project for me to work on. And when you were in the last episode talking about officially putting into the freezer your fiction project, I'm basically at the same position with what was Project Golem. It was, it was a thing over the past year that I should have put maybe a thousand hours into, and I probably put a lot closer to something like a hundred hours into that project. The thing that I've done, which may be a useful way for some people to, to think about how they decide on projects that are part of their life or not, is I have a couple of triggers that I've set for I can revisit this in the future if I want to, but only if two things are true. And one of those things I've decided on is, is a certain amount of video production on the YouTube side. That if, say for example, over the last N years, I haven't produced X number of videos, like on, like on average, that this is not even a project that I'm going to consider reviving until that statement is true. It can be very easy to spread yourself too far over too many things because you want to do a bunch of stuff. And sometimes it's, it's hard to come up with hard and fast rules for what you are or aren't doing. So for Project Golem for me, like I said, I've, I've said it kind of like, unless there's X videos in N number of years on average, this is not a thing that I'm even allowed to reconsider as a, as a project going forward. It's, it's a way, it's been shelved. I just wanted to officially get that on the record since I did promise an update a long time ago. But. Right, but we're not going to get any details. I was hoping we'd get a detail <laughs> Okay. Some so some description. He, no, okay, like, I kind of want to give details, but the problem is, here's the, here's the problem, Mike. I know that if I do, what's going to happen is I'm going to get a million people sending me emails saying, oh, I'd love to help you with that thing. And I, I, don't, I don't want to be on the receiving end of that. And setting these little triggers for when it can revive is actually my way of being able to put it to bed quietly and never think about it for a long time. So goodbye, Project Golem. We literally hardly knew you. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along. I was really I was really thinking like, oh, we're gonna get some details. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, do you even know who you podcast with? I don't know if you do. I was surprised to see it in the document. I was like, oh, wow, okay. Look, I just wanted to close the door. That's all it was. While we're here, uh huh. it's February. Yeah. You have not returned to the internet in full capacity. I'm just wondering, that's another project that has now kind of passed its review deadline. Mm -hmm. You're just staying away? Like, What's happened? Do you have, like, what's going on with you? I'm fine, thank you. Not coming back anytime soon. That, that actually, to relate to Project Golem a little bit, I do, have a, I do have two things that I definitely want to do and finish before I even consider returning. Right. Uh, so there's, there's two projects that I want to finish before I do come back, but I don't know. Uh, I, I'm kind of liking it out here. It's nice. Uh, f floating floating in the void, sort of separate from whatever is occurring in the maelstrom of the internet. So I, I, feel, I, feel, like I'm doing I feel like I'm doing pretty well. Do you miss anything? <sighs> yes. Yes, there are, things, there are things that I miss. And I think the two, there's two clear downsides. Uh, downside number one is I'm clearly more disconnected from a lot of... A lot of people I would classify as professional colleagues or conference friends or other internet personalities that I'm acquaintances with. And that to me has always been one of the primary use cases of Twitter in particular. Uh, but the internet in general is having an awareness of what a bunch of mm. people are up to. And they're people who I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily, like, we're not necessarily going to have an instant message conversation, but it's nice to have this level of acquaintance. And I think by far and away, that's the thing that um, I'm missing out on the most 
and in, and is also a very useful thing. Our friend Casey talks about the like the pyramid of communication. Mm-hmm. If you imagine, right at the very top is like a phone call, right, and then right at the very bottom is like an email newsletter or something. Mm-hmm. You've lopped off a bunch of them, so like ways that you might communicate with people through an app reply or seeing a post on some social network or like having mm-hmm. this like asynchronous communication of like you just know what they're doing, they know what you're doing. You've kind of cut off those avenues, therefore cutting off those relationships. Like if you don't mm-hmm. have a legitimate form of regular one on one communication with that person, whether it be through text messages or through some kind of closed social network or closed platform like Slack, then mm-hmm. you just don't communicate with them anymore. Yeah, it, it's the asynchronicity and the low level of it that's actually valuable. Uh, because there's a funny thing I've, I've thought many times. I almost wish there was a way in iMessage to specify a less interruptive text message that you want to send. So, mm. so, to, so to be able to say, like, this text message... It's perfectly fine for the person to only see the new bubble when they open up the messages app. Right. right. Like, I want to be able to say a thing and... Or even there's just like a low priority toggle. Yeah, or yeah, or something like a low priority toggle that... I mean, this is... Of course, you immediately run into this this email problem, right, where an email uh, some clients <laughs> will show that people can specify like an urgent email or... I, f- I forget exactly what this little system is, but I, n- I remember when I was in school, sometimes you would see that emails would have like three there exclamation a, marks next yeah, to it. That's a, yeah, that's a priority system that was in like Lotus Notes and Outlook and stuff. Yeah, but there were like three like, levels of, yeah. of, <laughs> of it. So they were always, all of them, three exclamation yeah. marks. Because why That's would right. you have like a one exclamation mark urgency right. of an email? It's wild. Yeah. And you'd have some people in a business setting who would only send, like it was just set as default or whatever on their outgoing messages, that all of their messages were, were three exclamation marks. Every email <laughs> that I send demands a reply. So they are all urgent by nature. Yeah. So, so listeners, don't worry. I, I understand the great dangers and inherent problems of letting a sender specify urgency of any kind in a message because it's just begging for abuse. But I've just, I've caught myself thinking many times, I wish there was a way, because like iMessage is a pretty standard platform for a huge number of people that it almost feels like it's it's too much of a jump up from email. Like I want something that's higher than email, but lower than a text message, which appears on their phone immediately. So that's why I've thought many times, like I kind of wish I could send an iMessage to this person that would just silently be on their phone for the next time they open the app. And in a way, Twitter was a sort of that kind of thing. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily assume that a person was getting an alert for your at message or anything like that. Or you figure like, Twitter direct messages were a whole other tier of communication that the other person was allowed to sort out however they want. It's like iMessages are too, because of the way they work on the phone, they're too intrinsically high level. So that's why for some people I would put in the acquaintance or conference friend category, I find myself sometimes hesitating about sending an iMessage because it feels like it's too interruptive and too demanding of their attention for... What what might just be like a just a little remark that I want to pass their way, which is like a keeping in touch kind of remark. So yeah, I've I've noticed the value in the kind of the asynchronicity of not even the one on one stuff, but just people just talking about what they're up to and sharing what mm-hmm. they're up to. Is then when you bump into that person again, t- two things happen. One, you have something to talk to them about because you're tangentially aware of what's going on in their life. And two, you don't have to have that awkward thing where they reference something, but you don't know what they're talking about because you don't follow their Instagram anymore. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's definitely a thing that I feel like is a is a useful tool of the internet that I do feel like I'm missing out on, is that passive awareness of what other people are up to. Yeah. And the occasional little touch points where you have some small interaction on Twitter, for example, and it's like, oh yes, we've we we have maintained this acquaintance relationship, and then it makes things easier when you see them again in person. But I guess the problem is those tools, those platforms, they also hold with it the worst of what you're trying to avoid. I guess. 
Exactly. And it's it's one of the reasons why Twitter in particular is the really useful one. It's the like it's the where everybody is chatting platform. But then it's it's also the platform of, oh right, there's also a, a huge number of followers here and people trying to get your attention for very like the the disadvantage is also the advantage that it is a, it is a great advantage to to not be exposed to people always trying to pull your attention in one way or another for their own ends sometimes or well, I, th- I think is also that there are just an endless amount of things to distract you on Twitter there's always more stuff like it's not even just people talking to you you can just go and find more things always constantly yeah that's true I, I mean I, I think for me Twitter on, on the how much was I distracted by it spectrum was always relatively low uh, you know something like Reddit and Hacker News were vastly higher on the how how distractible does my brain sure. find it spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I guess what, what I'm trying to articulate here is the the thing that is the advantage and the disadvantage is a kind of silence. That the, the silence is really useful and it's a thing that as time has gone on I feel like I'm appreciating more is the lack of input from the world. But that silence also means oh I don't I don't have the updates from from like the the further reaches of my social circle as to what people are up to uh and there just there is no way to get the one without the other really uh or in in any kind of effective method well there is oh yes you could have a private account (sighs) i don't I don't know. I mean, you could. I, I don't think yeah. that I would recommend it. I, I think that <laughs> it, it has a lot of trade-offs, right? Like, it just but, uh, how how would that work? I'll come. I'll come back to the internet and set my Twitter to private, and what boot a hundred thousand people off? Of well, it. no, no, no. But you could set up a second account, right? You could just set oh, up a like second a, account, no. a secret oh, account. Forget it. No, for, oh, that's a lot of hassle. Yeah, it's not as much that's... hassle as you would as you would think it would be, but y- it's it an option like that I don't. Think. But then you've got to like, then you got to refollow it, and you it's... follow like seven people. It's hard, it would be hardly difficult for you, but yes. Okay, sure. but like here, here's 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 the other thing, and this this will, you know, this this may tie a little bit into the movie we'll discuss eventually. But it's it's also the thing that having one account, which is the CGP Gray account, means that there are people who are following me. That it's like it's useful to know that, and to be able to sometimes reach out to people through which there's no other real communication uh, channel. So what you're right? saying is verified or get the f*** out. Right? <laughs> is what you're it's, saying. It, no, it's it's not just <laughs> it's not just verified, but it's it's the like I always think of Twitter as a useful way to have a door that's open mm-hmm. to some people. And by having a bunch of people following my Twitter account, it makes that Twitter account a real resource in some ways. Uh, that I've been able to take advantage of sometimes. So that that's why the private account is like, oh, this is this is no good because I'm not going to get other people following my private account, which then defeats this other useful value of it. So that's why it's that's not going to happen. So uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to set my account to private. Although there is a part of me which thinks that would be kind of hilarious if I did that coming back from the internet. <laughs> like, hey, yeah. buddy, I'm back. Uh, tweet number one: This account's now going private. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it would be kind of terrible, really. Yeah, I don't think that I don't think that would win me a lot of friends to do that sort of thing. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Eero. With Eero, you can build a Wi-Fi system that is perfectly tailored to your home. Considering the high bandwidth world that we live in today, you need a distributed system at home to make sure that you can get the best speeds available no matter where you are in the house or what it is you want to be doing. And with Eero, you can install an enterprise-grade Wi-Fi system in your home in just a few minutes. It all starts with the second-gen Eero device. It has three 5 gigahertz radios, which allows for increased speed and range, and it sits flat on any surface, connecting either over Ethernet or wirelessly. Then you can easily expand that coverage throughout your whole home by adding in Eero beacons. These are small devices that plug directly into your wall, allowing you to reach every corner of your home. And Eero is now introducing Eero Plus. This is designed to provide simple, reliable security to help defend all of the devices in your home from malware, phishing, and unsuitable content. Eero Plus can automatically tag sites that contain violent, illegal, 
legal or adult content, so you have powerful parental controls at your fingertips. It includes ad blocking functionality to help improve load times for websites that are full of privacy invading ad tracking, and it's also possible to have Eero Plus check the sites you visit against the database of millions of unknown threats to prevent you from visiting anything malicious. Eero Plus even includes subscriptions to one password for password management and malware bytes for antivirus solutions. Eero is super easy to set up. And one of the things that I love about Eero is the fact that you can very easily set up a guest network. So if you have people come over, you can just get them on the guest network really easily. And their app is super awesome. It's super clean. You can see what devices are connected to your network. And you can turn things on and off if you need to. It's super, super awesome. It's just part of the whole Eero package. Never think about Wi-Fi again. Get $100 off the Eero base unit and two beacons package and one year of Eero Plus by going to Eero.com slash cortex and at checkout use the promo code cortex that's e-e-r-o dot com slash cortex and the code cortex for that one hundred dollars off and a one year of era plus so you can get yourself a hundred dollars of the era base unit and two beacons package and that one year of era plus this is an awesome deal our thanks to Eero for their continued support of this show and relay fm so that is thing number one that i miss and that's the thing that is useful the other the other thing this is so hard to articulate I feel like I feel like listener. If you know what I mean, you'll you'll know what I mean. And if you don't, I, I can't explain it in words. I miss a certain kind of meme internet humor that you find nowhere else but the internet. As I, I just I always have this feeling like the internet is this terrifying wild west that's also just hilarious in a way that no other place is. Where you, where you have like meme mutation across this, you know, hundreds of thousands of users and humor can be really quick and really obscure sometimes. And so th- there's a certain kind of humor that I feel like there's no ability to replace this with any other medium. It's so intrinsic to what the medium is that it's not replicable. Because I think part of what makes it satisfying is if you get it, you feel like you're a part of something. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to articulate it. And you know that like other people won't get it. Like if you weren't there to see that meme mutate, or if you don't know what it means, or you're not part of the community making the joke and something just flies by, you can just think, I don't understand that. Yeah. But other people find it hilarious because they get it. Yeah, and I feel like it's the the thing the thing that to me is like internet artwork, internet genius is when a meme has been used a hundred thousand times in one particular way, and then someone finds the way to turn it in an absurd new direction, and that humor only works because the other way is so ingrained into your brain. And it, it, like that's a kind of unexpected humor that's born of an intense repetition that you're just not going to get anywhere else. The most perfect example of this, mm-hmm. which you were probably thinking of, is a meme called Loss. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm th- I don't think this is what I'm thinking of. I'm not okay. thinking of anything in particular, but... This is a perfect what's... example of this. It's this weird, like, cartoon, this, like, upsetting cartoon that results in somebody dying, uh-huh. and it's been mutated into a million ways to the point that... Oh, oh, this is the... This is... I know lines. this one. Yeah. Right, there's right. like four, like these, like four intersecting lines with a bunch of other lines can can symbolize loss. I'll put some <laughs> right, links right, in the show it's, notes it's, that try and explain loss. It's it's control alt delete. I, I I recommend I recommend a link for you to include. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a YouTube channel called H Bomber Guy. Okay, and he he did a 45 minute I think YouTube episode just about loss. Yeah, it's this. So this yeah. is a good so example. Loss is a meme that I don't really know other than like knowing that it exists in this format, right? Right. And and so I've found out kind of what it means later on. But this is like a perfect example, I think, of meme internet humor. It's like it tricks you because Mm -hmm. sometimes you're you're looking at a lost meme and you don't realize it until you realize it. Um, And you're only going to get it if you know about it. And if you don't know about it, it's just going to go by you. Like... Same as like kind of maybe on a more kind of general level, like Rick Rolling is like mm-hmm, a similar yeah. thing. Like if, if somebody sends you a link and you and you get to the Rick Astley song, if you don't know what Rick Rolling is, it doesn't mean anything to you. It's just mm-hmm. like someone sent me a dumb song. 
But if you know what Rick rolling is, you get the meta joke. Right. Or then the thing that I love is is someone does a mutation on that where the joke is almost you're expecting to get Rick rolled yep. and so, and something adjacent to it happens and it's like, "Oh, that's great. Like it's really good what you've done there." Mm-hmm. Uh so it, but I I like I've been thinking about that a bunch because it it's just a really good example of how a change in medium allows a, a different kind of expression. And yeah, me- memes are, are sort of dumb and jokey, but I also love it. Like I've always loved this stuff. Uh, I, like I've always, I've always deeply loved the like the crazy wild westness of the internet, like the you know the intrinsic coyote spirit tricksterness of it. And there's something about a certain kind of memey humor that feels like it expresses this really well. Or when you know people are just making the terrible mutations of a joke and you can twist it around where it's so bad but it gets repeated so often it becomes its own thing uh i I feel like nothing nothing really quite scratches that itch in my brain and like the the closest the closest thing is something like easter eggs in youtube videos you know where people hide something in a like that's not remotely internet-y humor but i feel like that's the that's the closest closest kind of thing that you can do and I think it is it is no coincidence that my most recent video, the airplane boarding video, is I think maybe the most packed with Easter eggs Shock of any video that I have done. Yeah, and like I'm, I'm kind of dying to know if people have caught all of them, but there are so you, many. You could do a video <laughs> about the history of Easter and have less Easter eggs <laughs> in that video than you do in the one you've currently got. Yeah, uh, but uh, like, but I think that was happening partly because of a kind of frustration in my brain. Like, this is the closest thing I can do. But it's like, how many things can I hide in this video? Right? Why are these numbers those numbers? You know, what did I? What can I stuff in the caption somewhere? Like, so many things uh, are shoved into that, and I, I, I honestly think it's a kind of expression of of feeling like I'm missing this kind of humor. Is Putting putting all of those things in there. So so what we're saying is people should go and watch the uh, airplane boarding video like six times to make sure that they catch it all. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously they clearly they clearly totally should. Well, that video is doing really well. Oh yeah, you know it's yeah it's, it's doing. Well. Maybe it's because it's everyone rewatching it trying to catch all the Easter eggs. Yep, probably. Which I will I will leave as an exercise to the viewers. But you know, there's a lot in there. <laughs> but yeah, so those those are my feelings. I miss those two things. I miss them quite a lot. But I, I don't feel any real sense of urgency to come back. And I, th- I really do think that, that a lot of the, the advantages are outweigh the disadvantages. And, uh, and primarily, you know, one of the main things I, I was talking about at the very beginning of this project was simply just the amount of reading that I do. And this has gone very well hand in hand with what I've talked about on the show about trying to change some of the ways that I work on videos and what the research and production cycle looks like. This has been a huge success in terms of the amount of reading that I do, the number of books that I read uh, has has dramatically increased. And there there ha- there has been a com- like a totally unavoidable, very obvious increase in my ability to focus and pay attention to the thing that I'm reading, which was the thing that concerned me the most. Uh, and so that's also partly why it, there is a hesitation to go back because the effect there has been so strong that it feels like confirmation. Oh, I wasn't, I wasn't wrong that I'm having a harder time reading things. And I think it's partly because of the nature of this medium. Uh, I think I was very clearly right and uh, yeah, so that's that's something else on the other side of the scales. Are you working more? I would say I'm working better. I don't know because I haven't really been time tracking. That, that's been an intentional thing off to the side. So I don't have data to support what? that. <laughs> you doing it to me again? What? You doing this thing? You did this doing something to me again where you're like, oh, I have this great idea. Come along with me on this ride. By the way, I've abandoned it. You're on your own. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay. We we talked we talked about this on the the first episode of the new year that I've I've temporarily paused time tracking. I'm I'm slowly I've just just within the last week I'm doing some slow exploratory. How do I want to return to this? Okay. Um, but I'm, I I mention it because uh, I haven't done time tracking for a while, so I don't really have hard numbers to back it up. 
But I can say something like, almost certainly the number of pages of printed material that I'm reading in a week is proportional to the number of quality writing hours in a week. And so both of those things have gone way up since I left the internet. But yeah, it's, I don't feel confident in making a statement like, yes, but this is also partly because of the fuzzy nature of my work. Like, how much does reading count as doing some kind of work? Do I really want to include that? Not really, even though I think it's an important part of it. So I, I, I don't feel like I have a clear answer to that question. But, but Mike, don't worry. I haven't abandoned you in time tracking land. I'm, I'm okay. coming back. Oof. I just, for part of the project of reorder, I specifically wanted to... Uh, this, there's a few things I'm doing with this, but I specifically wanted to remove as much of the structure of life that, that past me had imposed on things. And that even drilled right down into the concept of, of what categories of his life does he track. Again, like I'm not interested in what that guy thought about anything. So on, on as, as many areas as I've been able to, from big and small, I've tried to remove as much influence from that past me had as possible. So that, that is just one of those areas, an intentional stepping back. But don't worry, I'm coming back, Mike. I won't, I won't leave you in time tracking land. Today's show is brought to you by Away. Away makes smart premium suitcases so your luggage won't cost more than your plane ticket. Look, if you're anything like me, when you're traveling, one thing you always want or one thing you're always in fear of is battery. I'm always scared my devices are going to run out of charge and then I'm going to be stuck not being able to listen to my podcast on the plane. Well, when you buy an away suitcase, you'll be able to charge all your devices while you travel because both of their carry-ons feature USB ports with a battery large enough to charge your phone five times from a single charge. If you go to awaytravel.com slash cortex20 right now, you can browse away suitcases featuring premium German polycarbonate, which is unrivaled in strength and impact resistance whilst remaining lightweight. You can choose from over 10 colors and five sizes, including their carry-on, the bigger carry-on, the medium, the large, and the kids carry-on, and they cut out the middleman so you can get first-class luggage at coach prices. Away suitcases have patent-pending compression system, which is great if you're an overpacker, along with four 360-degree spinner wheels. The carry-ons are compliant with all major U.S. airlines while still maximizing the amount you can pack with TSA combination locks built right in. Also, away suitcases feature a removable washable laundry bag so you can separate your clean clothes from your warm ones. Last weekend, we had a little staycation in London and both me and my wife Adina, we both have away carry-ons and we were able to get everything that we needed in there really easily for our weekend. When I was walking through London, I was able to just have it either on four wheels or if I'm going over rough terrain with the cobble streets of London town, I could just pull it back on its two wheels and just pull it behind me. And then when we got home after the weekend, I just took the laundry bag, I opened it over the hamper, emptied it in, easy. I love my Away suitcases and I think that you will too. Away believe in the quality of their products, which is why they offer a lifetime guarantee. If anything breaks, they will fix or replace it for life. And they also have a 100 day trial with a no questions asked return policy for free shipping on any order within the lower 48 states of the US, but they do ship to many destinations around the world too. Go to awaytravel.com slash Cortex20 and if you use the code Cortex20 at checkout, you'll get $20 off any of their suitcases. That's awaytravel.com slash Cortex20 and the code Cortex20 for $20 off. Our thanks to Away for their support of this show and Relay FM. The American Meme. <laughs> a Netflix original documentary uh, follows oh. around a selection of um, influencers, some social media influencers, and also has a lot of interviews with other individuals, uh, people who are uh, famous on the internet, people who were famous on the internet, that kind of thing, to kind of reinforce what's going on. Uh, it's a very well-made documentary. Uh, I liked the presentation style. I liked that it had something to say. Like, it clearly had a, a point that it was trying to make. Um, I really like it. Uh, you recommended this to me, and I want to know how you came across it, and then kind of to set this conversation up why you thought it would be worthwhile for us to talk about it well i'm feeling a little bit guilty about recommending it to you because of of your emotional reaction to it this morning and the the mood that it's put you in i just came across it because netflix seemed to think this was the thing that i absolutely had to watch and so at the end of everything i was watching at netflix it was like hey 
I don't know if you know, but we've made this documentary called American Meme that we think is a 99% match for you. So we're going to recommend it every time on everything. And at some point I just watched it. And so, yeah, I, I recommended it just because I thought, like, there is a way in which this movie strikes me as a strange kind of work documentary. I'm not sure if listeners have watched it, if they would perceive it that way. But I, I think it is. I think it's a documentary about how a new kind of famous person works. It is a new kind of job. There is a line in the documentary which I think was misguided. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody's, I don't remember who it is, but somebody's giving an interview and they're talking about like, oh. So the reason it's called The American Meme is because it's a pun on the American dream. And mm -hmm. they, they, I think they clearly came up with the name because one of the parents of one of the people that they're following starts talking about the American dream and like a light bulb mm -hmm. probably went off in somebody's head of like, oh, we have a name for the documentary. It's the American mm -hmm. meme. Um, because she said that the American dream has changed because they came from Russia. They, em they emigrated to America and the American dream when they were a kid was a, was a specific thing, right? Like two car in every garage, you know, opportunity, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, this is, uh, for, for people who are, this is Krillix's parents. Krillix is an interesting sort of person we'll talk about later. I've but... never heard of this person <laughs> before this documentary. Honestly, never at all. Everybody else I knew of a little bit, but this guy, I think for reasons that are clear, I had never come across him. Cause, like, yeah, this is, this is what we describe as like... The world he operates in is yeah, a very exactly. different the... world to me. I, I, I think of the... Um people do those infographics of like the podcast universe and like yeah. what places overlap with others. And if we're, if we're talking about just the internet universe, it's like Krillix is in some kind of galaxy light years away mm -hmm. from any of our circles. So it's like, I'd never come across this person before, but it's, it's his parents talking about that idea, the American dream, but it's, it was not only for them. It's also like the, the dream is obviously that they want it for their kids. The, like this, the dream that they have these, this physical, and product security in life that they have all the nice things. I think that guy's name is Kirill. Kirill. Krillix oh, was, Kirill. A, was a handle that he went with for a while. Okay. Yeah, he went through a bunch I of I will handles. not say his handle uh, on the show, but his name is Kirill. K-I-R-I-L-L. -L. Right. Kirill. Um, and yeah, and then they end up with this son who has this... I mean, is in his world very successful yeah. but it's just a totally unexpected kind of thing for them as parents it was not not what they were dreaming for their son uh and he, he went in sort of a a, a different way yeah um, he has a like a, a job i think most parents would be embarrassed about and yeah. uh, oh don't worry mike we'll get to him okay great okay <laughs> okay well maybe great but yeah so yeah that's where like the, and so the the line that i was getting to is it comes off of kind of talking about that to be like oh the kids today they want to just be famous as a job. Like they, they, mm -hmm. when they want to ask them what they want to do when they grow up, they say they want to be famous. And I have a couple of problems at this point. Mm -hmm. I think that's always been the case. I don't think that there's anything any inherently different about people's desire for fame, right? Mm -hmm. But now there is just more paths to it. And the biggest thing, which they touch on, like a bunch of influencers touch on during this documentary, is that there is now nobody that can get in your way in the same way that there was in the past. Um, mm -hmm. Usually there would be layers of people you had to go through to say what you wanted to say or to get a platform for yourself. But now people can just sign up for an account and they can do whatever they want and they can say whatever they want. So I, it kind of frustrated me to hear that because it's kind of just, it's like perpetuating this stereotype of lazy millennials, uh, which, I, which I don't enjoy. I just think the difference... For the millennial generation of which I'm a part of is we were born into a genera into a world where the internet was a thing and mm -hmm. the internet has brought with it new types of jobs and we both do them. And mm. people like those types of jobs because the internet gave, brought with it and for the millennial generation brought with it the idea that you can do whatever you want and the internet can can give you the tools to do that in a way that maybe wasn't the case before. So um, that was like the one thing that frustrated me about the documentary is that like they made this documentary about all these people and then kind of just like poo pooed the idea of anybody wanting to be this way. Um, and I think that that was purely to enforce the narrative of sadness through 
uh, the people that they they picked, which is a genuine thing. Totally get it. Like it's real, but that was definitely every documentary has a has a through line, and the through mm-hmm. line of this documentary is that this life ultimately leads to just abject sadness. Yeah. Well, well I do agree with that. The the one little asterisk that I put on that statement about being famous is while I do think it is true that humans seem to be creatures that have always uh, craved social approval and the more the better Uh, and so like the you know I think you can go back to medieval ages and there were children who wanted to be kings Mm -hmm. like this I don't think that's really any different my asterisk though is I do think that there is something about the modern world which allows the encouragement of a kind of non-specific fame. Yes, it's just famousness, not I want to be a singer, I want to be an actor, I want to be famous. Yeah. But I think a lot of people have in their mind what they want that to look like, but they just use the word to explain what they're trying to get across. Because Mm. the idea of, of famous people now, they're less pigeonholed into a certain profession because Mm. people have more opportunities available to them. So, like, Paris Hilton is... The the whole documentary kind of pivots around Paris Hilton, which is brilliant. Like, like there's... I have a completely different thought about kind of everything we do now because (laughs) they, 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 like, they basically say that she is, like the kernel of all of this social media stuff and i agree like having seen all of this like yes of course she was doing all this stuff a long time ago and you know a lot of the idea of like fame coming from nowhere Mm -hmm. came from her obviously she had a an upbringing that allowed for it but like she just kind of exploded onto the scene and then became a massive superstar without really doing much of anything but Mm -hmm. she now does so many things She has so many different businesses and there are so many celebrities that are like that now that they are less known for one thing because they can do many more things. More doors are available. Hmm. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good point that she did start as a, a non-specific famous person. A socialite. She just was a socialite, which is a term that actually doesn't really exist anymore because influencers replaced what socialites were oh wow okay I, I was i was just trying to mull over what do you mean by socialite doesn't exist as a thing anymore you you've you've totally sold like me when no, we were you, younger, oh, yeah okay you've, that was you've the term sold me. for like this person's photographed going to a bar and it's like important where they're going mm-hmm. but now nobody nobody could give a crap what the paparazzi are doing mm-hmm. they see all this stuff from the perspective of the people that are already there or the person right. themselves so, like, socialite and influencer are just the same thing, but now that role of influencer is more powerful than the socialite role used to be. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I do want to I do want to pause you here because th- there's a thing which I think is important to mention at the start of this movie, which is so I watched it the first time and I thought, oh, let's you know, I wanted to recommend it. I thought it was kind of an interesting thing, and I watched it again last night. Uh, to refresh my memory about it. And there is a thing that when you know it also really changes your perspective on this movie, which dovetails into exactly what you're saying. Paris Hilton is the executive producer of this documentary. Huh. All right. Yeah. Ha. Huh, right. It makes a lot of things make much more sense once you know this. Huh. Uh, It's because it makes you realize, how did this documentary come into existence in the first place? It's obviously her creative project. And then the second time I'm watching this documentary, I just kept thinking, the first time I saw it, I was impressed by Paris Hilton does so much more stuff than I really had any idea, simply because I had no reason really to pay attention to Paris Hilton. Again, like she's she's off in like another orbit, totally unconnected to my own orbit. But then the, the next time through, like I kept being much more impressed with how crafty she is and i was paying much more intention attention to like what parts of her story is she telling in this documentary and what are what are other people saying about her in this documentary upon which she is also an executive producer 
And I, I think that the documentary itself is, is like an example of its own thing that Paris Hilton, a famous person who does a bunch of stuff and that aggregate up into her own fame is adding to that portfolio this artifact, which is another thing that increases her fame in the world that is her project. Mm. Like, like, the, like the movie, I don't know, I found really on the second viewing, the movie like twists in on itself in this interesting way in, in that in almost any other circumstance, if you found out that a documentary of which there was one primary subject, that person was also the executive producer of that documentary, you would feel a bit like, oh, I've been deceived. It's totally thrown, thrown everything into question about what is here. But this is actually a perfect case where, no, this is, this is an example of the very things you're talking about in the documentary. It proves the point. Yeah, it proves the point. It's like, this is another Paris Hilton project brought to you by Paris Hilton to increase the overall fame of Paris Hilton, which is also incredibly successful because I, before this came along, I probably haven't thought about her in 10 years. Like, I remember her exploding onto the scene when I was younger in the early stage of her career, seeming to come out of nowhere and then being absolutely everywhere. And I haven't thought about her in a long time. And then... Through this documentary, she is reinforcing her fame through a group of people who either haven't come across her or just haven't thought about her in a long time and made a really interesting thing to further this point. So I just I just wanted to mention it because I think it's it it makes the documentary more interesting watching, but it's almost a spoiler to mention it ahead of time. But I found it fascinating when I was watching the credits being like, wait a minute, executive produced by Paris Hilton. Amazing. Oh, fantastic. This is great. <laughs> yeah, that is really amazing. Like, I, I, you know, again, like I was I kind of found myself astounded going through it, like listening to her talk about the things that have happened in her life. And like she she references a commercial that she made for Carl's Jr., which is a mm. fast food chain in America that was too hot for TV. Mm -hmm. And like she kind of she made this commercial and then realized, oh, this is interesting. Like I can I can leverage this idea again. And like just the way that she talks about some stuff that she did in her past and like the, some decisions that she made from it were just it was just really clever. And I also just feel really sorry for her, too, um, at certain points. Like there's this one moment where she's talking about the paparazzi mm -hmm. and she's standing in front of this artwork that she has in her home, which is a picture of cameras and it flashes and you can also she can also turn sound on and it can make the noise of camera bulbs and stuff and she said that sometimes she hears flash bulbs even when they're not happening mm -hmm. and i was just like i feel bad for her in that moment like that made me feel sad for her like that's a crazy thing to happen to you that people take your picture so much that you hear it when it's not even happening yeah, it's like phantom phone syndrome, yes. but for paparazzi. Yeah. Which, which sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, it sounds yeah. terrible, really. Like, I also think the, the other the other thing watching this, so again, like the documentary, she sort of spans her career mm -hmm. over the course of this thing while being interspersed with other influencers. And again, it's very well produced, really interesting. I genuinely recommend it. But the other thing that I can't help but perceive as a meta purpose of this project is that it's she's reinforcing her fame but by the end of the documentary she's she's using the documentary to I could be reading too much into this but I feel like she's really walking you to the conclusion of why she may be withdrawing from public life to some level yeah that that she does not want to be this socialite outgoing at parties kind of person and that she's working on like the, the the documentary ends with her creating this virtual reality version of herself that she's thinking about how can she use this in future projects and and what can she do with this where she doesn't have to go places and she doesn't have to go out and she's she's really like taking you step by step 
And, and I think with scenes like showing all the paparazzi of trying to show the viewer why after, you know, and as she said, like after 20 years of being in the public eye and having to be this brand of like a crazy 20 something party girl that she wants to pull back. And so like, I don't know, I, w- I was just looking at this and yeah, again, thinking like, God damn it. It's really clever. Like this is also a clever way to with your fans, maybe start to delicately suggest that you're not going to be around as much or you're not going to be visible as much. And, and this is like a document that you can point to that is very sympathetic towards that case. Yeah, because at the beginning, I feel like she's going a little too heavy on the way that she interacts with her audience. Mm-hmm. Um, but by the end of it, I kind of believe it. Like at first, I'm like, there's no way this is true. Like she's talking about how much she loves her audience and that she FaceTimes with her audience. Like sometimes like she will exchange phone numbers with people and they'll have text messages. And she says like she otherwise feels lonely and that her audience kind of gives her a sense of family. Mm-hmm. But then by the end of it, when she's then talking about the fact that she wishes she had a family and everyone that she is friends with has kind of moved on in their lives except for her, I'm kind of more inclined to believe what she's saying in the beginning. Yeah. That it's kind of what she has. Like that's that's all that's left for her now. Yeah, she does go very hard in, in the beginning, which which is also part of like one of the things I think is interesting to talk about with regard to this documentary is the ways that a bunch of these influencers cultivate relationships with their fans. Um, but her... This opening where she where she does go through, like you say, all these details of, of how close she is and talking about feeling, you know, traveling everywhere, it feels very lonely. Uh, it's it's almost so intense, it's it's a little hard to take seriously. And there's another great pair of YouTube videos called Selling Stupid by a YouTuber called uh, George Rockwell Smith or Smith. And he does that, but he does that as a as like a joke about how people do this. So he has this whole thing about like, oh, I felt really lonely before I started YouTube. And every every one of you has helped make me feel less lonely. But he's doing it in this cynical way to demonstrate like this is what people who are influencers say to make you feel closer to them. Like it's a it's a tactic in, and it's like an exploitative tactic. Right, Because this is why I was kind of rolling my eyes at the beginning of the documentary. So it's like, well, it starts off with her just saying all this stuff that I've heard people say that, like, I try my very, very best to be, like, to talk about things the way that I actually feel them, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, like, that that's not something that I could ever imagine myself saying, you know, stuff like that. Like, I have a great appreciation for what people are able to give me in my life. You know, the fact that we have people that listen to our shows means a lot to me because it means I can live the life that I want to live and can do the stuff that I want to mm-hmm. do. But like words like I love every single one of you is like it's right. it's a really heavy thing to say. Yeah, her her exact quote is I love my fans as much as they love me. Which which is which I find an uncomfortable sentence yep. on both ends of yeah, it. Yeah, that's the sort of thing where I'm like ah, that yeah, uh, yeah, and so I, I agree. Like, it starts out a little eye rolly, and all, all I can think of is is the the cynical joke version of this that I've heard on YouTube to make fun of this kind of thing. And again, I came I came away very much feeling like Paris Hilton is a really clever person, and and like there are many things that she says in the documentary where I don't think that she's lying. But as a as a public person, sometimes you can decide like which side of a thing do you want to emphasize. And there are there are quite a few sentences where I feel like if Paris and I were going to get coffee and we're chatting and we're actually friends, I could hear a different side of that same thing, like a different side of it emphasized. But nonetheless, I ag- I agree with you that by the end of it, I'm much more sold on some of the sincerity of what she means at the beginning of it mm-hmm. and 
and yes, the the documentary, the reason why Mike is feeling the way he's feeling probably is because it, it the documentary really is a bit of a like a tour of sadness through a bunch of influencers' lives without being really heavy handed about it. It's just I think it's just sort of showing you a bunch of stuff. And for for some of these people at the end, I, th- I think you feel really quite badly for them. And Paris Hilton in particular, it does come back around to at the end when she's talking about her other peers who stay at home and have families and that means a lot to them and she doesn't have this, uh, that it makes the beginning part much more believable. But but nonetheless, one of the things that this documentary does does touch on that I feel I do feel so uncomfortable with and I, I see a lot of influencer people do is is this kind of family talk about their fans and I I, I really I, like this kind of stuff just always makes me feel so uncomfortable and I I think it it often makes me think of of what we've discussed before the corporate thing where a company tells you that we're all family members here like like when I when I worked at a school and they're like we're all just a we're all one big family taking care of these children it's like well no not really uh and it's by the way that's it's, super weird to say especially when there's children involved like it makes it super it makes it so much worse as like a uh, yeah, thing like, yeah, I heard that, and I was never, I was never able to be like, "How do you want me to parse this sentence?" Uh, like, the the way I think you want me to parse it is as a kind of, you want the loyalty that I would give a family to exploit, right? But like, we're not a family in any meaningful way. And this is another person in the documentary, DJ Khaled, who I will say comes across to me as being vastly more either disingenuous or just well i'll leave it as disingenuous with his is like all of my fans are family and when someone shouts out my name on the street i'm like boom stop what i'm doing that's family over there like i gotta say hi to this person fam love yeah it's and it's that kind of stuff makes me really uncomfortable and i don't know if it's too far to say it but there is there is something when i see people do that 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 feels it feels a little exploitative and I'm not perfect about it, but it is, it is why I try even to avoid the word fan. Like a, my, my preferred phrasing is to talk about the audience. Like that's, that's the level that I'm comfortable with. But like I said, I'm not perfect. Sometimes I will use the word fan just because a sentence is clearer and less awkward than that. But I, but I feel like that's the appropriate level of relationship here. Yeah, because language is so difficult. Like I know yeah. I have and will use the word love, mm-hmm. but it's not what I what I mean, right? It's yeah. like it's a different thing. It's like a a great appreciation, or you know, like a feeling of like some level of indebtedness or what, whatever it ends up being. But it's so there aren't really words uh, to describe a lot of the things that we're trying to say a lot of the time. Yeah, and you have the double problem that a word like love is a word that does a lot of heavy lifting on many fronts in the English language. And and so it it's a word that intrinsically blurs boundaries, mm-hmm. is used in many different contexts. But the one the one with Paris Hilton where, you know, cuz it inevitably happens that influencers and creators end up having communities and then those communities end up using words to describe themselves or their relationship to the creator. Mm-hmm. And Paris Hilton's one was at the most apex of this that I've ever come across this, where, you know, her her community of fans calls themselves the Little Hiltons, which is fine. No problem with that. But then they often refer to her as mom. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, man, that is the most top tier level of fan to person communication I've come yep. across. And all of their usernames is something dot Hilton. Like people take on the name as if it's their name. Yeah. That that, that this is a this is a family thing and she mm-hmm. is the mom. And I don't know, like I had such mixed feelings about that. And at one like one of the things I thought when I came across that the first time is I felt really sorry for what must be some non-zero number of 
mothers of children who are super fans of Paris Hilton who refer to Paris Hilton as mom. And then as the parent, you're in some kind of some kind of like weird sort of but not really competition for attention with Paris Hilton as like a mother figure. There is a worse example of this that comes next, though. What? What's the what comes what's worse? I missed it. Where she says that like some people refer to her as Jesus as like Jesus. And okay, she thinks no, that that's see, really nice. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I took the no, but here's the thing. That goes so far over the top that to then then to me, that was almost an example of Mimi humor where people are photoshopping her as Jesus in all of these situations. Right, but like the idea where she's like, oh, they call me this and I think it's really nice. Like, that's way too much. Uh, I mean, yes, saying that you are the son of God is quite high on the apex, but like to me, it is, it was, when I watched that, I took that as just so hilariously high, I can't take this seriously. And whether or not she means it, my brain interprets her as as doing a little bit of like a smile and a wink when she says she thinks that's great. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's why the mom one resonates much more for me because it it feels okay. It feels too real and impossible not to take in a somewhat serious way. Whereas the Jesus one is like, okay, but now when you're showing me photoshops of you at like the Last Supper, it's I can't take this seriously. <laughs> I don't know. Am I like? Do you think I'm? too sensitive about that sort of stuff but it's it's just something that that always strikes me this this cultivation of a relationship i would say you put a lot of emphasis into the meanings behind words Mm -hmm. which on the face of it is a silly sentence to say it's not i don't think it's as silly as as you think it sounds to me no but like like i mean like just on the face of it that that's just a silly sentence you care about what words mean it is something that that is true about you, and it's something that's rubbed off on me a little bit over time. Mm-hmm. Like for example, one I never tried to use the word lucky. Mm-hmm. Like I'm so lucky. I try not to use that word very much. I like to use, say fortunate instead, mm-hmm. because for me personally, like I feel I work really hard and have worked really hard for what I've got, and lucky would implies to me in my mind that I did it it had nothing to do with me right right that, that I was just right place right time and I obviously believe there is an element of that of course there is there's an element of luck and there's an element of right place right time but I also had to work really hard as well so I consider it more fortunate it is mm. good fortune for me to have the job that I have um, I have been fortunate I've been lucky slash worked hard for it so that so like that that's the kind of thing that I focus on Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. And I know why this stuff means, like, it really grates on you or really, like, has an impact on you because of the way that you think about these things. Like, I know your problem, your long problem with the word community, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I've heard you say it. Oh, yeah. That, but that's what I mean. Like, I haven't been perfect about it. Yeah. And it's no, impossible, because we, it's it's impossible, impossible to be. To because be. Yeah. If you hear people say a thing all the time, it just becomes part of what you say. It's like in the same way that my accent has changed over mm-hmm. time because of the people that I talk to. Like it's not even just my American friends who I talk to for my shows. I can tell that my Romanian wife is changing my accent right and yeah. it's changing even the words that i use like talking to adina like there's just some some ways that words are structured and sentences are structured if you are romanian so if you mm-hmm. speak english and you're romanian there's some words that you use in in orders that sound weird to a native english speaker and i find myself doing that a lot mm-hmm. now so yeah th- this is just a thing that happens so hearing yeah. people say i love all my fans and we have such a strong community you're going to say it at some point because you keep hearing right. people say it all the yeah. time. Yeah, and, and and because I think the uh, like I'm trying to think of the most technically correct way to phrase a thing would be something like, I am glad that the audience keeps showing up. Is it like a terrible sentence to try to convey multiple times in many ways? Yeah. And then you, you compound this as well with something like, uh, you know, and, and again, partly why... I thought American meme might be interesting to discuss because 
while we've mentioned these people are in different galaxies than us, this is also a work documentary that is adjacent to what we do. And so I will have conversations with industry people in which I will just completely use the word community because it's it's the conveyance of an idea and to to try to be more precise about it is runs against the purpose of language which is to communicate with someone else in a professional context and and so yeah that's that's also why like it just it just seeps out and it becomes the word and it's also possible to imagine that in 10 years that the the newer sense of a word like community just completely has washed over the old one so much that this becomes an objection which goes away as well right because mm-hmm. words words change and they're flexible over time but but i just i don't know i just i still think at the at the very top seeing paris hilton as mom slash jesus and dj khaled's fam love of for his family of millions of followers i just wonder how much of that is engineered to in intentionally create a, a kind of intensity from the audience because I, I know that that is a thing that people do like intentionally try to engineer an intensity and I feel like family level intensity is too far like it's it's too much um I mean to, like to go back to go back to the thing we were talking about before why do I like to put Easter eggs in my videos? One of the reasons is because like, that's the kind of thing I always like in videos. And I think it's rewarding to a certain kind of viewer who likes those sorts of things to go back and then try to hunt down, like, what are the little in-jokes? And to me, that feels like an appropriate level of reward and intensifying of fandom. But the family level, it just, just makes me, just makes me uncomfortable. But that may be why I don't have a hundred million followers on Instagram, because I'm. You no, because you just don't use it. But I don't, I don't know if Instagram is the right platform for you personally. I think Instagram your is life. is the best platform for me, Mike. I can't imagine a platform on, on which I would have more success than Instagram. I did but. want to note that actually that this documentary almost entirely focuses on Instagram as social media. <laughs> yeah. For, for a lot of this documentary. The phrase social media and Instagram are one and the same. Yeah, that's very true. And I found that to be kind of fascinating, but makes complete sense. Why do you think it makes sense? Because for most people, well, Instagram is the most mainstream social media platform now mm-hmm. of which people share themselves, right? So Facebook exists, yes. But Facebook isn't really an influencer-driven platform. It is a mm-hmm. people-you-know platform. And then, right. so then of the other ones, of the other big platforms, you have Twitter and you have Instagram. But Instagram is a much more successful platform for influencers because they get to influence you with influential things that you can see. That's the point, right? Mm-hmm. Because there's like a lot of talk about ads and like the amount of money people can make from ads. You know, numbers are thrown from $50,000 per post to a million dollars per post. Mm-hmm. And I really like there is... um. Uh, somebody they they used to be on Vine. I don't really know much more than the person's name, Amanda Cerny, mm-hmm. and she says uh, people walk away from ads on TV, mm-hmm. and I just love that. It's, it's true. People don't want to see ads on TV, but they will consume ads to sponsor content on Instagram mm. because it's people that they believe in telling them a thing. You know, like it is, there is an implied relationship going on, which says, I trust this person, so I'll pay attention to what they have to say. Yeah, and it's also reflected on the industry side in in ways that I find quite breathtaking, because uh, in the documentary, yeah, like you said, they, they go through uh, the price for single photo ads that are on Instagram of, of like the celebrity using a particular product, you know, from 50 to a from 50,000 to a million. Uh, but the thing that, that is much more, I mean, those are big numbers, but what's also much more striking to me even than that is, is the audience size for those things. So that like the industry slang for this is like CPM, right? How, how much does it cost to get a thousand people to see your ad? And 
you know, different industries have different rates. And, you know, we, we've sort of discussed like podcasts have a pretty good rate compared to other mediums. And I think it's partly because people are hearing the podcaster talk for so long and then the podcaster does those ads. It's actually a similar thing. So the, the influencer is an endorsement led advertising, yeah. which for a lot of podcast advertising is the same uh, because you trust us. Which mm-hmm. I would just say as like a as a line, which is why I sell her ads, mm-hmm. because I know how important that relationship is, and mm-hmm. I don't want to take advantage of that. So we decide the advertisers that we work with for that very reason, because I don't want to advertise a product that's bad, yeah, that makes people trust me less, because then that undermines what we're trying to do here in the first place. Yeah, and th- and there's a synergy here, right? That it, if, like if you are a trustworthy person and you're you're not just doing any ad, right? But you're selecting the ads, then that will probably increase your CPMs over time because you get a higher response from the audience. Yep. Like it's a it's a feedback loop. Yeah, and and so like podcasts generally have much better CPMs than YouTube videos. Just like not always, but on average. But then the the thing that I I find astounding is is like, but if you're looking at charts and this is why i was joking about like oh i I should be on instagram more is instagram cpms like you know the the cost for an advertiser to reach a thousand viewers those rates are crazy high and it is just astounding to me how much more valuable to advertisers a photo on instagram is worth than anywhere else and that's also why it, it totally makes sense that if if you are trying to play this game of being an influencer, Instagram, that platform is worth a hundred times more to you than something like YouTube, just straight up from an advertising perspective of the effort that goes into producing a photo for an ad and, and the rates that you're going to get and the frequency that you can do it. It's crazy. Um, but that is that is also why the documentary is so heavily focused on Instagram, because people who are playing the influencer game, they're not dummies. They know that's where all of the money and the attention is. And that and that's where you can really integrate yourself and someone else's life from the audience perspective of of what are people looking for. So, again, it's not it's not uh, it's not my platform of choice. But I, I find it just a, from my perspective, it seems like a very surprising outlier in, in terms of rates and response and audience. But it also but it also makes sense. People like looking at pictures of people. And that's that's what Instagram that's what Instagram gives you. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Squarespace. Make your next move with Squarespace because they give you all of the tools that you need to make a wonderful website for your next idea. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform. There's nothing to install or patch or upgrade. They take care of everything so you don't have to. Squarespace has got it covered. And they have your back of award-winning 24-7 customer support. So if you need any help when setting up or running your website, they will be there whenever you need it. Squarespace lets you quickly and easily grab a unique domain name so you can put a wonderful name to your website and people will know exactly where to go. And when they get there, it's going to be beautiful because all of Squarespace's templates are professionally designed. They're all beautiful and very customizable. I love that Squarespace is full of different functionality. If you want to add an online store or a blog, you can do that. If you want to add a portfolio, you can do that. If you want to add maps or music players, Squarespace has all of this stuff built right in and it's drag and drop to easily customize. When we were getting everything set for our wedding, we set a Squarespace website up. It's super easy to do it. They have templates that are specifically built for it and we were able to integrate all of the tools that we needed to make sure that everything was taken care of. Squarespace is great for any type of web project that you have, but don't just take my word for it. Go try it out for yourself. Go to squarespace.com slash cortex today and you can sign up for a trial with no credit card required. Their plans start at just $12 a month, but you can get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain and show your support for this show if you use the offer code cortex at checkout. Once again, that's squarespace.com slash cortex and the offer code cortex to get 10% of your first purchase. Our thanks to Squarespace for the continued support of this show. Squarespace, make your next move, make your next website. There's a quote at the beginning of the documentary from Kirill. He says, my real life isn't that interesting, so I feel like I have to put on an exaggerated truth. And this is a thing that I hear a lot. And I, when I see people say that like Instagram makes them 
sad or they don't mm. like it is because they feel like all they're seeing is this exaggerated truth and it gives them the fear of missing out, like FOMO, right? Mm -hmm. And I find it really interesting. And I don't know if I come at this differently because I am a person who shares to to an audience on Instagram um, mm -hmm. or if I'm just wired a little bit differently. But I, I come at it of, at a perspective of the stuff that I share on Instagram are just the most interesting things that I'm doing or the things that I find the most interesting. I'm not personally going out of my way to manufacture anything in my life to share on social media. Like there are just, these are things that I'm doing and I'm choosing to share what I think is the most interesting. So when I see other people doing stuff, I'm like, Oh, that's just the most interesting thing that they're doing right now. Like, if I see someone who's doing a bunch of stuff, I think, oh, it looks really cool. My first thought isn't this person does cool stuff all the time. Like my thought mm -hmm. is just this person just shows the cool stuff that they're doing. And mm -hmm. that is like a big difference for me because I don't feel like, oh man, I'm so boring mm -hmm. because I watch Netflix documentaries at home when I could be out climbing a mountain or going to a nightclub. Like, my thinking is just, like, the way I come in is those people also watch Netflix documentaries at home, but they just don't show you that. And so it's just an interesting thing to me that people do feel that way, and it's interesting that there are people that feel like that they can only just create false things. Like, they have to just create things out of nothing so that mm. they have something to share. It's just such an interesting thing to me. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot in that, you know. Again, when I when I talked about having used Instagram for a while, you know, we talked about it on the show and and also in private. I, like, I I could not articulate why Instagram made me sad very well. Like, it just it did, but it wasn't anything specific as as FOMO or anything. Like, it was just something about it made me sad, and I couldn't pin it down in a very precise way. But I do, I do think you may be wired a little bit differently here because... I do think I am. Yeah. I do you, think I you am. You are more cognizant of people just showing the highlight reel of their life. But nonetheless, I think there's, you know, there, there are many cases where people can know a thing intellectually, but say the emotional part of their brain, just it just does not register and it does not land. And I think this is a case where maybe the the knowing part of your brain and the emotional part of your brain are more lined up in what is happening on Instagram. And so I think almost anybody who follows lots of people on Instagram could articulate the idea that, oh, of course, they're showing the most interesting parts of their life. Or, of course, these photos are staged. But nonetheless, I, I suspect most people have the experience, have the emotional experience of not being able to internalize the time compression effect that occurs where you just don't see so much of what's going on it's even a, it's even a thing it's, like i feel it's like the absence of one thing does not like prove its existence or non-existence like i think people see if all i ever see mm -hmm. is this person doing something fun they must only do fun things yeah like and like that people aren't stringing together or people's brains and don't do a good job of stringing together the in-between time yeah well like I, I even think to a much lesser extent than something like instagram but us doing the podcasts even has the same time compression effect that you know like we're we're, we're the things that we talk about relate to what we're doing or or things that are going on in the world or stuff that we're checking out but like as the listener is listening to shows say especially if they're say catching up on on the back catalog like they're they're flying through life at a much accelerated rate and then also when you hear a new show you're just thinking about maybe what happened in the previous show and i think there's a way in which most people's minds kind of erase the information that th these these things happened two or three weeks apart that they didn't happen side by side. Uh, I mean, just, like, just think about how many how many episodes are in between every time we go to WWDC, right? Like, there's a tremendous time compression effect there, and 
that can make it feel like, oh, we're doing much more than we actually are. Mm -hmm. But, but I think that's also part of, part of the business of being this influential person on social media is, is to be aware of that and to create these things. I don't know. It was, it was acrylics or krill. How, what, what, how should I say it? <laughs> I'm not going to, like, I cannot remember. It is Kirill. Kirill. It's not krull. I, I, krull is also what's in my head here. No, it's Kirill. Kirill. <laughs> okay. So, like, let's talk about Kirill for a minute because. Oh, boy. Especially on the second viewing, I, I think Paris Hilton and him are the two most interesting people in the documentary. They're, they're actually focused around him. So, like, the other the other two people is uh, Josh Otrovsky, who goes by the Fat Jewish, and Brittany Ferlin, who was very, very popular on Vine um, yeah. and has since kind of moved to other platforms. But has I think, like, her big thing was she was very... She was, for a time, the number one person on Vine. Yeah, which which is uh, we can touch like I feel like is a is a curse to wish upon any person. And the Josh guy is, from my perspective, kind of almost certainly thinking about Paris Hilton as the executive producer. He is her friend, and the two of them probably realized they were enough to get this thing off the ground. And yeah, and brought on other people to be in the documentary. Had an interesting life, and there's like all this plagiarism stuff around him, and then he started a successful business, like. He is an interesting figure uh, to to tell a story around too, but he doesn't have what the other three have where um, Paris and Kirill and Brittany all seem to have a much greater undercurrent of sadness than him. Yeah. Or at least he doesn't show it. Yeah, and, and I think he's the, he's the least interesting person. He also strikes me as a like a particular personality type that I find incredibly repulsive, which is the person who will do absolutely anything for attention and it's like, uh, like I want well, yeah, and nothing that, to do with you. He doesn't, <laughs> as like, he just doesn't care what he does. He'll just do it. Right? Yeah. Like, um, and, you know. so, so like he, he's he, to me, it's like, Oh, you're in this documentary because you were Paris's friend and you can see, you can see the strings knowing that she's the executive producer. But uh, going back to Krull, and talking about his Kirill. Life. Great. How are we going to do this? <laughs> do we need a different name? No, no, it's fine. Well, okay. we can't use his actual Instagram handle. No, we cannot the Sensorious use that. hand of Mike would be too much. Um, even yeah, but so there's there's this there's this thing with people who have public personas, which I find annoying. Is where where someone will say something like, "Oh." I have a public persona and that public persona is not me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nothing like me. And then if you're in the position to actually meet these people, very often it's like, oh, your your public persona is you. Like it, you don't seem any different. You know, like you're you're not Andy Kaufman playing a character here, right? You like this is this is totally you. Uh, and Josh in the documentary strikes me as that way. Like I have a, it's impossible for me to conceive that he's any different in real life than he is the way he portrays himself in the in the video, which is part of the reason why I find him less interesting. But Kirill has has this real arc of sadness across the documentary. So wh when you're introduced to him, he he is introduced and comes off as basically like a total bro asshole party guy and his like i don't even know quite how to describe this job but his, like his job is to be the party at bars and events he is effectively the hype person at a party yeah he is creating games what weird and wonderful and wild things are occurring around him all the time and he is effectively making it a night to remember for the people that attend the place that has hired him. He's yeah. like, no, I was gonna say he's like a magician, but I don't think that's the right way to put it. Like, I don't really know how to describe him. He's also an example of a, a thing that I think is interesting to keep an eye out for, which is you sort of look at this guy online and you think, oh, this guy is just just this party bro, and it's very easy, I think, for someone to look at him and think of him as 
this this idea of like, oh, he just got lucky doing this thing, but anyone could do this thing. But his his backstory is this like, oh, he actually was trying to be an animator and they show some of his artwork. It's like, oh, he was actually skilled enough to be an animator. Like that's a thing he could have done. Not just an animator. Specifically, yeah. he wanted to work for Disney. Yeah. Which is so wild when you then see what he does for a living now. Yeah, but it, it, like, I think it's a good example of here is a person with talent and he's trying to figure out a way to expend this. And so he's initially wants to be an animator and he's he's good at it, but he decides this isn't the path for him. And then from from there, he's they sort of brush past it really quickly, but he's doing a little bit of stand up comedy. Like he's working at comedy clubs and he must have been good enough to get access to pretty serious people because he then translates this into being the photographer. And I think it's such a smart thing that he says that like he wanted to be around the important people backstage. And so he had to figure out how to make himself indispensable to those people. And it's like, man, what a, like, that's, it's such a clear way to think about something that many people don't, where they're like, I want to be famous. I want to be in the green room. Right. But he's like, how can I be useful to those people? And so then he's, he's taking photographs and he's, a very skilled photographer and and so skilled like he's flipping through these pictures that he he took and and real professional musicians are then hiring him to do photo shoots with them like oh we only want this guy to do our photos while he's on tour uh it's it's Nas he still has like the official iTunes photograph for like it's crazy how good he was at this and then at some point this is less clear to me but he starts to transition on his Instagram to taking photographs of parties and like taking photographs of crazy debauchery but also kind of making it look beautiful it's and and where he gets his fame is he's he did a series of photographs of party girls getting champagne poured on their faces whatever you think about what's happening at the party the photos are striking the photos are attention getting and that seems to be what launched him because he he notices that this starts becoming a thing that when he is the photographer at events, people are requesting that he does like pour champagne on me and photograph it. And this this somehow becomes his his transition into being this professional party dude slash photographer. And I find it interesting because I think it's a, it's a good example of someone trying to trying to like navigate by compass what are they good at what's useful what are people requesting and he even has a really quick line in the documentary about how it's like it's so sweet he has like the sweetest russian mom in the world who's like she's just so cute and she's talking about oh he was always such a good boy and he never got in trouble and he always went to school on time and all this stuff right and and how like he was a he's a good kid, but he himself always recognized that he had this ability to be like a total asshole that people still kind of liked. And he takes that personality quality that he can generate and turns it into being this party person. And more than many people, by the end of the documentary, I am really on board that this persona of him is a thing that he has created. It's not him. That like if I were to meet him in person in private, he wouldn't be the thing that he seems on Instagram. Cuz he also like he says he purposefully tries to say things that he knows will upset people too. Yeah. You know, and and I don't agree with that as like a way necessarily to live your life. I think that there's still something about you <laughs> If you come to that idea, but this is not a discussion we need to get into now. But I, I, I do think I understand what you're getting at. Where like he seems to have a little bit more depth to him than his Instagram feed would seem to indicate. Yeah. And there was something that his mom said that I did find interesting, which I'd never thought of before. Which is like, if an actor plays a criminal in a movie, you don't think the actor's a criminal. Yeah. And I was like, that's interesting. The viewing experience for me was 
especially on the second time round, I felt I was much more aware of him on the second viewing that I feel like you go for this real emotional switch of, of kind of assuming he's this jerk that he is seeming at the beginning and like, oh yeah, yeah, everybody says they're not their persona. But by the end of it, I, I really think that he isn't. And, you know, there are a few things that he says where I feel like this this man, his path to fame led him straight into a kind of Dante's Inferno that's also a rave. Yeah, I, I think he has the hardest life and the hardest job out of everybody here because his job is to go to a different nightclub every night, get drunk and party. Yeah. I couldn't do that. I, I like, couldn't, yeah, I couldn't possibly do it. And and the other thing about, like, that I just kept thinking about afterwards is it's so clearly a job that's destroying him. And it, it's destroying him physically. It's destroying him through just the tremendous amount of alcohol consumption that he basically has to do to be part of it. And it's also destroying his ability to relate to people. Like, he he has a, is a quick little line, but he talks about how have have you ever tried to talk to people? They're awful and I hate them all. And I was like, whoa. And it, it, it strikes me as a really genuine line, but I think it's well, also... Also, he's saying, like, have you ever tried talking to a drunk person when you're sober? Yeah. Well, so this is the thing. He says, you know, that that's even worse than just talking to someone and mm-hmm. that he has to get down on his level. But the, the, thing, the thing I kept thinking of is like, like, of course this is going to happen because... Every night he's he's entertaining the Morlocks, and like he's he's got to go into these places, and I think it's fair to say that these kind of mega parties also attract a certain kind of person, and then he's interacting with essentially exclusively these people, and is also in a customer service role in a way, mm-hmm. and it's like I cannot imagine a more perfect storm to create out of what was possibly a Disney animator the world's most intense misanthrope. That, that, like, that seems to be his arc. And I feel, I feel the worst for him at the end, even though he seems like the biggest jerk at the beginning. There is like a, a thread that sums up towards the end of the movie of like, how are you supposed to get out of this? Mm-hmm. Like, and 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 it really focuses on Kirill as well here. So, what's he supposed to do next now? Mm-hmm. Like, he's in this life. What is the next part of his life? Like, what do you do? Mm-hmm. And it shows some people who have moved on, right? So, you know, like it it shows uh, Josh, the fat Jewish. He's created a wine company, mm-hmm. and so he's like, well, I've got my out now and i've created a thing mm-hmm. which can uh, he says like what do i got like three years doing this character this this person is mm-hmm. influencing but now i have a business and there's there's a there's a guy whose name escapes me which is kind of funny considering his point in the documentary is the guy who was in a britney spears video <laughs> and right yeah since erased himself from social media and he's kind of talking about like these people are stuck because what do you do? Where do mm. you go? Like you can't just reinvent yourself. Like what if nobody wants what you want to do now and they mm. don't care about what you do next? And like that is a real fear for people in any kind of entertainment. But I think even in a way it is way harsher on people who live for likes. Yeah, and and the and Britney, the Queen of Vine, is is just like the really harsh example of this. Yeah, because her platform was stolen from her; it was taken away. Yeah, that it it, it disappeared. She was the number one person on Vine, uh, and in particular that that case, uh, I I feel really bad for her because she was also the number one person on Vine right at the beginning, and she also has to then deal with. The, the the statistical inevitability that as a platform decktuples in size, 
the person who's the number one person at the start is probably not going to be the number one person at the end of an incredible mm -hmm. increase in size. Like that's just the way platforms work as you bring on viewers. But like, especially it's funny because one the first person to knock her off is a friend of hers who she introduced to the platform. Right. And then there's the next person to go above her is another friend that she brought to the platform. And I can't help but notice the little remark where she says something like, he did it right, Im implying that the first person to knock her off, like maybe there's some animosity there. Mm. But but still, like, no matter no matter how much you tell yourself about what matters and what doesn't matter, it has got to be psychologically crushing to be like, I'm the number one person on this thing. And then to boom, 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 get ratcheted down to be the number, but, but the number 10 person on the thing, like that has to be really hard. And then it all goes away. Vine, you know, Vine gets destroyed, which leads to what YouTubes will always and forever call the Vine refugee invasion, uh, where they all, like they all tried to transition to the platform, but it's like her, her moment was over. And this is also the thing of like her style of humor was very good for Vine and just didn't translate as well for YouTube. And it's and, you know, it's it's so crushing as she's trying to get into acting and and real roles. And the very fact that she was such a well-known person on Vine is now nothing but a detriment to her that people don't want to consider her for an acting role because she was this Vine girl and she's too well branded as this thing it's it's just awful like it's so it's so it's so trying and you know her way out of this seems to be a relationship like that's that she's like i'm basically a, a normal person now mostly and i'm in a relationship and that's that's her path out and you know paris hilton is paris hilton is checking out of public life entirely possibly but grill is he doesn't he doesn't seem to have a clear path like the other the other main focuses of the documentary do. So there's a reason why this documentary maybe like, you know, made me a little sad or is it was this an interesting thing to come to is that I feel like I am trying to make some changes in the way that I use social media, but I don't know how to make them or what they are. Mm -hmm. But there's just something that I've noticed recently, like the main thing Sometimes I feel like when I am going to Twitter, which has been my home on the internet for like 12 years mm -hmm. now, I feel like I'm going into battle every time I open the app. Mm. And the reason I feel this way, I think, is that there's just been a change in the kind of style of general discourse mm -hmm. over the last few years where everyone feels just more angry. Everyone's more angry now about everything. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it does one of a couple of things. One, people are more angry at me <laughs> and at everyone, right? Uh -huh. So, like, you will say a thing and people will want to more vehemently tell you why you're wrong or tell you why you're stupid. And the other is, I know I perceive more people as being angry at me than they probably are. Mm -hmm. And... This is not a thing that I feel on Instagram because people aren't really talking to each other very much. Right. So, like, I have increased my usage of Instagram but have not decreased my usage of Twitter for a variety of reasons. Like, I have a note in my Apple Notes which is titled Rules of Engagement. And I've been trying to, like, plan out on there like where do i want things to go and what do i want them to be mm -hmm. one of my biggest problems is my hot takes <laughs> hot takes get everyone in trouble so like something will happen and i'll have something to say and then I'll, and then sometimes i will then spend the next 48 hours either debating with people or just being told why i'm stupid Right, this is just a thing. You know, this is a thing that happens to a lot of people, and it. I know it's not necessarily exactly as it, that seems, but that's how it feels. You know, because as is normal, the thing I think we've spoken about, we've touched on. It's not an original thought of the idea of like the bad stuff stays with you more than the good stuff does. Right, right? it's just a thing that happens. It's just a human nature thing. 
So, yeah, I just think this has hit me at a time where I'm like feeling like I want to change some stuff. I don't want to leave Twitter. I, that's because I get so much out of it personally for mm-hmm. many reasons. You know, like it is a great tool for me to tell people what I'm up to. Um, it's a great tool for me to understand what's going on in people's lives, like which is exactly what you were talking about, right? Like the thing that right. you're missing. It's It's great for that. And it's also like my most valuable feedback mechanism. Mm. Yeah, like it really is. Like most of the time, it it's great. Like the feedback that I get in reference to the shows that I'm doing is just proportionately better than the feedback I get from the tweets that I post. Right. So if I say something on a show and people are reacting to that thing, by and large, it's helpful stuff, mm-hmm. or they're telling me some thoughts about it. But if they're reacting to a tweet that I've sent, it tends to be more angry. Right. You mean you mean like a like a tweet hot take. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you know, I think it's probably because my hot takes on podcasts I can explain them. Right. I have more than two hundred and eighty characters to get my opinion out. Um and or there's such a barrier to entry that typically by the time that people have opened the their Twitter app they probably they don't care about telling me why I'm wrong anymore. Right. So, you know, I just figure like I don't want to leave any platform but I want to change what I put into them all because I have such a valuable mechanism to share my opinions, which is this, that I don't really feel like I need to give my best opinion for what, for likes and retweets. Like, that's why I'm doing it, right? Like, I'm sharing a hot take in the hope that it gets retweeted a thousand times. Like, that's why I'm doing it. That's why everyone does it. You wouldn't do it otherwise. So... Maybe I need to stop doing that. Um, but at the same time, there is a line at the beginning which calls all of this stuff a new drug. Yeah. I was opening my Instagram whilst watching this documentary. <laughs> uh-huh. Because, like, we've had some big life events happen over the last weekend, and people were very engaged with the things that I've been posting. Right. So... It's just this self-fulfilling thing. I don't know. I'm at a point where I'm looking to try and think more and be a little bit more considered about the places I share things, not necessarily about how much I'm sharing and that maybe my hot takes are best served lukewarm multiple (laughs) days later on a podcast than they are in 280 characters on Twitter and that I just continue to get feedback and share stuff that I'm working on, things I'm excited about on Twitter, and more things about my life on Instagram. Like That's where I think I'm kind of settling. Mm. The problem I have is sometimes I really can't help myself. Right. Sometimes that hot take, it feels so hot. You got to get it out of your hands right now. Yeah, and the only people that can, can really deal with it are the people that are following my Twitter profile. <laughs> I don't know. This is just, it's just like, I feel mm-hmm. like this has come at a time when I'm already thinking a lot about this stuff. And I don't really have a lot of parallels to the things that these people are talking about. I do think that there is a, like a, a an image portrayed in this documentary that everybody that lives a life like this is sad, which I don't think is the case. I think everybody in the world has periods of sadness. Yeah. But like it, it, it seems this, this documentary seems to claim that like, if you live your life on the internet in public, that you will ultimately be sad. And that's the only path, which I don't think is true mm. completely. And that, I know that's not how I am, but it, it, it is just like, I have noticed some stuff that I would prefer to be different, but I can't, change them like i would prefer if twitter would go back to how it was six or seven years ago right but the genie's out the bottle now there's like yeah. nothing can be done about that yeah it's it, yeah it's the same thing it's like if i could if i could freeze the internet as it was 10 years ago like that would be great that'd be my preferred fun interneting i, I do think i agree that the, the documentary everybody everybody is sad in american meme but I think there, there there's a there is a true thing here which is that especially now that there is this concept of I can be famous on Instagram being an Instagram model or whatever it is that you're doing like not even the non-specific fame but I do think that is much more likely to attract the sort of person who is then 
also going to be more vulnerable to the vicissitudes of those platforms. So I wouldn't I wouldn't be surprised if if you could say that there was like a higher proportion of something like depression among people who are professional influencers than the general yeah. population. Yeah. Again, that, like, I'm not saying they're all depressed, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if you did a longitudinal study and said like, oh, right, it's yeah, 20 percent more incidences of depression. Yeah. I, my, my point is, which I you know you're, you're agreeing with, it's, just, it's not a cause and effect relationship. Yeah, I don't think it's a cause and effect relationship, but I, I do think, you know, it's it's a bit like um, Brittany Vine Girl at, at some point. She, you know, she tells the audience that she was a really into drama as a kid. And it's like, well, no one's surprised. Like, you don't need to tell anyone this. You're obviously this kind of person who really wants to be on a stage and is really looking for that feedback. And it's not surprising then that, that platforms are going to disproportionately attract those kinds of people who are then also more vulnerable to the changing weather of the platform, or I think are, are going to be more vulnerable than the average population to negative feedback or, or criticism or all of these kinds of things. So I, I do think there's, there's a feedback effect here, which isn't good, but I completely agree. It's not a, it's not a cause and effect situation, but it is, it is something that, that, that makes me a little worried that there's nothing to do about it, but like intrinsically these platforms attract people for whom, which maybe it would be better for them not to be on. Uh, like from from the large scale down to the small scale, but I don't know. It's again not cause and effect, but I think there's some correlation there. 